Hello there, we are rolling into our last week of content where we are talking about the right to privacy. As we will see in these cases, there is not one clear test when it comes to the right to privacy, and in part that's because it's not something we can easily point to in the Constitution, but rather have to derive from other principles. So as you go through this, think about all the ways in which this test differs as we move through it. So as I mentioned, the idea of a right to privacy is not specifically mentioned anywhere in the Constitution. We do have some cases that show us a glimmer of this right prior to the major cases we'll be talking about today. For example, in Olmstead, which is a Fourth Amendment case primarily um, that involved wiretapping phones, Brandeis' dissent argues that a general right to privacy exists and that the Fourth and Fifth Amendments are evidence of this right to privacy. We also can see from contract cases like Lochner versus New York, which we um, can think about in a few different ways, whether it's administrative law, contracts, or um, employment law, but the idea that people should have the freedom to contract with other individuals and that should not be interfered with by the government. Um, this is a matter of privacy for the courts as well. So there are glimmers of this right in cases prior to the ones we're dealing with directly today. But the first case we'll deal with is Griswold versus Connecticut. It is a 1965 case in which a Connecticut law, which had stood for quite some time, uh, it was an 1879 law, uh, was passed that banned the use of any drug, medical device, or other instrument that, that um, furthered contraception. A uh, gynecologist at the Yale School of Medicine, Dr. Buxton, opened a birth control clinic in New Haven in conjunction with Planned Parenthood, which was headed up uh, in Connecticut by Estelle Griswold, hence Griswold versus Connecticut. Uh, both of uh, these individuals, uh, the doctor and Griswold, were arrested and convicted of violating the law when they dispensed um, contraception. Um, in particular, two married couples. Um, their plan was actually to use the clinic to challenge this law, and they got what they wanted. So the issue here is whether a state law that criminalizes the dispensing of birth control to married couples is unconstitutional as it violates the privacy of the couple. The idea of the law, of course, was that the state wanted to protect um, conception. It wanted to promote conception and promote childbearing um, because there is an interest that the states have in having more citizens um, for a variety of reasons. So the problem for Griswold um, in this instance is that there is no specific right to privacy in the Constitution. But the court looks at this and finds that there are um, embedded in the Constitution indications that there is a general right to privacy. So the right to privacy is not one specific right in the Constitution, but rather a penumbra of rights formed by what they call emanations from the guarantees provided elsewhere. So the court talks about the First Amendment right to free association being um, evidence of this right to privacy, the Third Amendment right to be free from uh, quartering troops, the Fourth, Fourth Amendment right to be free from unreasonable search and seizures, Fifth Amendment right to be free from self-incrimination, and then you wrap this all up with the Ninth Amendment, which says all of the rights captured in the Bill of Rights are not all-inclusive. There are rights beyond this. Um, and so the court says, given all of this, it is clear that the founders intended a right to privacy exists so the court says such a law as uh, existed in Connecticut can, cannot stand in light of the familiar principle so often applied by this court that a governmental purpose to control or prevent activities constitutionally subject to state regulation may not be achieved by means which sweep unnecessarily broadly and thereby invade the area of protected freedoms. In other words, the state can have the goal to uh, protect the sanctity of life, but it cannot invade people's privacy to do that. Um, 
So we see here, actually in this picture, um, this is Estelle Griswold right here holding up the sign. Uh, the other person is um, the president of the Planned Parenthood League of Connecticut at the time. Um, and the law was found unconstitutional. So that brings us what I would argue is one of the most un, un, uh, misunderstood cases in the Supreme Court's uh, long history, which is Roe v. Wade. In 1970, um, an individual that the court called Jane Roe because of the subject matter involved, they gave her a pseudonym, um, filed a lawsuit when she was unable to obtain an abortion in the state of Texas because the because Texas had a law making abortion illegal except by a doctor's orders to save a woman's life. In other words, she could not choose to have an abortion. In her lawsuit, she said that the state's laws were unconstitutionally vague and abridged her right to personal privacy protected by the 1st, 4th, 9th, oh, 1st, 4th, 5th, 9th, and 14th Amendments. So she's restating the penumbra. So the question here is whether this Texas law um, criminalizing abortion violated the right to privacy recognized in Grid Griswold. And the court, um, in an interesting turn of events that was not expected to happen right here, um, agreed that it did violate it. And largely it agreed because the court was really concerned about the sanctity of the doctor-patient relationship. They felt that legislatures should not be interfering in that. So laws that absolutely criminalize abortions in all situations violate that right to privacy. They also set up this trimester framework that through the first trimester, which is the first third of a pregnancy, the abortion should be left completely, or the abortion decision should uh, be left completely to the woman and her doctor. In the second trimester, the state may regulate abortion, but only to protect maternal health. In the third trimester, the state's right uh, to protect what they call the potentiality of life um, could kick in, but they could only regulate um, insofar as they left exceptions for the life or health of the mother. So under Roe, restrictions were to be viewed with strict scrutiny um, when it came to determining whether they violated someone's constitutional rights or not. 20 years later, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, we had a revision of Roe. Now, this came up as an attempt to overturn Roe, and Sandra Day O'Connor, who you saw there, uh, or you see there, um, is one of the justices who authored the majority opinion. And the reason why I put her picture there um, is because she's largely the one responsible for bringing this opinion together the way it did. Um, she did not want to be known as the first female justice on the court and also the one to restrict a woman's right to choose. So they had to deal with this issue in a way that satisfied the more conservative side of the court, while uh, at least enough of them to get a majority, while also um, bringing into the fold the uh, more liberal side of the court. So the case involved a Pennsylvania or a couple of Pennsylvania laws. They required that a patient be given informed consent, that they have to wait 24 hours after being given informed consent to opt into an abortion, otherwise known as a waiting period. Minors had to have consent of one parent or uh, a judge to have an abortion. And for women who were married, they had to have confirmation that they notified their husband of the intent to abort. So the issue was whether these laws violated the constitutional rights recognized in Roe v. Wade. Now, they reaffirmed the right to an abortion that exists in Roe v. Wade. However, they changed the analysis. Instead of using strict scrutiny, instead they would use this undue burden test. Um, so no longer did strict scrutiny apply. Instead, we had this viability analysis um, instead of the trimester analysis. 
framework and this undue burden test. So the viability analysis says states cannot implement abortion restrictions prior to the viability of a fetus. They said that the trimester framework doesn't make sense given advance in science. So 23, 24 weeks, um, fetuses can become viable outside of the womb. And if states want to start outlawing abortion at the point of viability, they, that was within their right to do so provided they allowed for exceptions involving appropriate medical judgment for the preservation of the life or health of the, of the mother. Prior to viability, um, states cannot implement abortion restrictions um, that pose an undue burden on a woman's fundamental right to an abortion. Now, an undue burden um, can be interpreted a lot of different ways, and states have certainly tried to bend this interpretation or this definition quite a bit. But generally speaking, an undue burden is a, a substantial optical, obstacle rather, in the path of a woman's choice. The end result here for these, this law was that all of the restrictions were upheld except for the one for married women having to tell their husbands. Um, the other ones they felt were not undue burdens, that they did not uh, place an undue burden on someone's constitutional right to have informed consent or a 24-hour waiting period. For minors, they felt like this was an appropriate um, an appropriate measure to make sure that minors were not um, seeking abortions um, without parental consent, as it still is a medical procedure. Um, but for married women, they did not see um, a, a need or a constitutional um, kind of line in the sand that made it necessary for married women to inform their husbands of an intent to abort. So they did... Um, they did uh, overturn that particular part of the law. Planned Parenthood versus Casey is still good law and is pretty much the governing law um, as we sit this moment in 2020 um, for how abortion laws in different states um, should act. Next, we move to sexual orientation and activity involving sexual orientation. So Lawrence versus Texas is an interesting case, in part because it's almost exactly the same as a case uh, that happened um, in 1986 called Bowers versus Hardwick, but the two had different outcomes. Um, so in the case, there was a report of a weapons disturbance in a private residence. The police entered because a roommate allowed them in. Um, and the police saw Lawrence and another man named Tyrone Gardner, both adults, engaging in private consensual sexual activity. They were arrested and convicted of deviant, deviant sexual intercourse and violation of a Texas statute which forbid... Uh, two persons of the same sex uh, engaging in uh, certain intimate sexual conduct, including sodomy. The law did not um, prohibit men and women um, from engaging in the same act. So the question was whether this state law could be enforced because it treated same-sex couples differently than opposite-sex couples. And the court said it could not. In a decision by Justice Kennedy... Um, they said that it was un invalid under the due process clause, that these two individuals were free to engage in their conduct without the intervention of the government, hence privacy, and that the law furthers no legitimate state interest. Now, of course, the state was trying to say, just like it said in Roe and Planned Parenthood versus Casey and Griswold, that they were protecting procreation, that if you prohibit this act, I guess you somehow... Uh, turn activities towards procreation instead? Not exactly sure. Um, but uh, Kennedy's response to that was, was kind of uh, tough. It's not enough. Um, and Kennedy made this decision on June 26, 2003. There was another case in June 26, 2013 called U.S. versus Windsor, which overturned uh, the... Uh, yeah, it overturned the Defense of Marriage Act, which, by the way, that was a tax case, um, if you didn't know. And then in 2015, we get Obergefell 
uh, versus Hodges. This is the case which came out of the Sixth Circuit, including uh, Michigan, that sought to overturn various states' prohibition on same-sex marriage. So the issue that was presented here was presented very much like the issue in Lawrence versus Texas. Now notice that the abortion cases take a slightly different tactic than these cases do. So the issue here is whether a fundamental right is being denied, that fundamental right being the right to marry, um, because it involves two people of the same sex. And... Um, Again, Kennedy, writing for the court, says that this law violates um, people's right to marry. Effectively, your right to choose who you want to marry is a privacy decision. So it's an extension of Lawrence versus Texas by Kennedy. Um, the problem with this decision is that it doesn't give us a good framework for deciding anything else in the future. Um, that said, this decision has impacted a lot of lives, um, many many people that I know. Um, and this portion of the decision right here um, is often quoted as, um, it's almost kind of made its way into pop culture. You'll see it on a lot of things. Um, and um, this uh, case has been very influential, I think, in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, Kennedy, for a while, became a bit of a pop culture icon in um, the LGBT world because of these cases and his uh, decisions in them. Uh, interestingly, fun fact for you, um, the couple that um, is from Michigan is the only couple that actually had a trial at the district court level. There was an actual trial on Michigan's ban on same-sex marriage. And um, further interesting fact, um, I was behind one of them in line at Target one day, so... Just saying, I had a brush with celebrity. All right, last case we'll talk about is a, an entirely different um, set of circumstances, and that's Cruzan. Uh, some people say Cruzan, some people say Cruzan. Say it how you will. Um, this case involves uh, the right to die, or rather attempts to make a constitutional case for a right to die. The issue here is whether the Constitution protects the rights of the next of kin to refuse life-sustaining treatment on behalf of someone else. So we have rights as individuals to say, especially in advance, that we don't want certain uh, life-extending um, medical procedures to be done on our behalf. You can say, I don't want a feeding tube, or I don't want this, or I don't want that. You can write it all out beforehand. But if you don't, and many of us don't, um, what are the rights of those around us to say um, that t the time has come? In the state of Missouri, there was a law that had a pretty stringent evidentiary requirement uh, that the family could not prove that um, she would have chosen this on her own, that Nancy would have made this choice on her own. In fact, I think a lot of our families would have had um, trouble, would have trouble finding that right um, in any circumstance. I mean, I don't know about you, but my parents or, or husband would probably have trouble figuring that out themselves. Um, so the issue here is whether individuals can do this on behalf of their family members, whether that's a privacy right. Um the court agreed that individuals hold the right to refuse treatment, but when people are incompetent, when they're in a coma, when they're in a persistent vegetative state, they cannot exercise that right. So states can say, absent clear and convincing evidence, which was the standard in Missouri, um, that the person wants treatment to be stopped, the state can require treatment to continue. Um, and that this exists so that family members don't take advantage of people. In other words, there's no right to die under the Constitution, um, except when you have set that forth yourself. And as we've seen in other cases involving assisted suicide, um, you know, that right might not extend as far as we think it does. Interestingly enough, this case helped to um, pass the Patient Self-Determination Act, 
um, which requires hospitals and nursing homes that receive federal funding, um, requires them to give patients advanced directive information and explain right to die options that are available in those states. So this did change the law and it did change circumstances for many other families. All right, takeaways. One, a right to privacy exists under the Constitution. Two, we don't know what that right is in all circumstances because it's not clearly spelled out even, um, and it's not applied evenly. The right to privacy often involves acts that may be viewed as controversial or um, against dominant social norms, and that's why we get these cases. Different tests develop in different areas. There is no one guiding test uh, for right to privacy cases. Um, and the right to privacy might be um, kind of subsumed other, other legal issues as well. So um, the framework may not necessarily matter as much um, in each individual case. All right, that's all for this week.